when new stuff is coming out daily, for instance, that convinces me that we're within six months to a year of a major uh, social upheaval relative to the crash of religions. This may coincide with the um, uh, breaking into the Vatican archives. I can't say at this stage, but the other events that are coming out include uh, Fomenko's uh, um, book on history being released in English, at least the first four volumes out of seven, mm. and, and also now the uh, many um, uh, threads that are that are starting to emerge, the secrets revealed that are coming out of the dark side of the Catholic Church. As one edifice crumbles, you get to the next, you get to the next. Now they're starting to go into, you know, uh, which popes were assassinated, who had uh, imposters put in place, and all of this kind of stuff. So some of the, the details are coming out, as well as we now have videos showing the actual schism occurring within the church itself as the um, all of the cardinals and archbishops and all of these guys, all the middle-level managers all the way up to the um, higher-level thugs within the corporate um, uh, organization that is the Catholic Church, were called back to meet with the head dude here, uh, the capo. And when they did so, a strange thing occurred, because in these long receiving lines, it is quite clear in the videos that are coming on out that many of these people won't shake Ratzinger's hand. They are there's some kind of symbolic rejection going on, almost a shunning within certain groups of the um, uh, controllers within the Catholic Church. So I suspect there's a major schism that's going to come on out really quick. And it may relate, may, may appear with or without Ratzinger's death, uh, but it may also be coincident with that. All right. That's, um, boy, that's an area that's really uh, difficult to get into with, um, you know, given that, um, well, I know I'm a Christian, and I know a lot of our listeners are. That's uh, a pretty difficult, I mean, a pretty difficult concept to, you know, yeah, get, but the, get, your head, get your head around. I mean, you know, I, I, folks, I believe that Cliff isn't actually saying that, you know, let's take down, let's take down the church, let's take down the church. He's reporting to us what he sees. Correct. As a report. He's not doing this on a personal basis. This is a report that he sees, and even though it's difficult no, 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 to no. listen let's, to, we have also, to we have to consider this. Yeah, but let's also be real clear about this. There is a general trend to the to the destruction of religion, and I think I have finally found the huge linchpin that's going to come on out that will see the destruction of religion. That the data is shown all the way back since 1997. But also, there is a trueness in I must state an individual bias that's well known that um, the it is my personal feeling and conclusion and opinion that the construct, the abstract that is the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, and any other church you care to name, harbors a great evil and needs to be gone. That has nothing to do with the theology of any religion or any of the, uh, the good parts of it. I'm just saying the organization is filled with thugs. It's as corrupt as any other uh, system on this planet, and it needs to go just as the money system needs to go, especially since the Catholic Church is uh, uh, closely linked to the Rothschilds and is deep into the middle of all of the derivatives mess and is also out there killing children like mad and is part of this huge uh, international pedophile ring. And so I don't, it's not it has, actually the, the religion itself, it's the organization no, no. behind it. You're correct. And also, let's, let's bear something in mind. If Fomenko is even close to being correct, mm -hmm. every single Christian on this planet has been deluded by the churches that theoretically are offering them, I'm putting this in quotes, truth. Because Fomenko has found that, that the personage that everybody thinks of as Christ had to have lived and died in the year, uh, they died in the year 1078 that there was no history that predates uh, the basically what we think of as the year 1000 that is in any way meaningful. Christ never lived back in year zero. Our year, we may, if you want to think of it that way, and Christ actually lived in the year, uh, was born in 1056 and went through to 1078 in that realm there, then we're really only in the year 1000 something now. And we've been lied to our entire lives because there was a move in the 1500s by this guy who called himself Pope Gregory mm -hmm. and that he had to not only rework the calendar, but they had to create what was known as the new history.
Now, when they created that new history, they were not really smart because they didn't understand archaeology and they didn't understand document scanning. Of course, there was no way they could have known in the Middle Ages. But what they did was to take all the Middle Age rulers that they knew about, rename them and push them back in time hundreds of thousands of years and create them again as Julius Caesar and all these other fellows. But they did so in such a way that the details of their lives are clearly available to us who can see all of the eras. We can find, for instance, this particular ruler ruled for 41 years, supposedly, in the year uh, 100 AD. But in fact, he was in really alive and ruled for 41 years in the year 1300. And they just pushed it back those thousands of years because they had to create this new history to go along with their uh, the construction of all of the religions. So if Fomenko is right, and this guy's been working on this since 1973, and we and need to... Discuss- who, who is Fomenko? I okay. mean, a lot all of right. our listeners might not be familiar. Give us all a, a brief um, sure. biography of him before we go on, because this is really interesting, because my family is involved in this. I mean, this directly relates to me personally. So go go ahead. Sure. Okay. So here's what happened. The, the Russians <clears throat> uh, had a communist society that imposed a politically correct educational system on all the teachers and scientists. Mm-hmm. The, po- the politicians decided what they could teach and what they could um, investigate as scientists and teachers. Okay. So what happened was when the Russian communist society collapsed, all the teachers said to themselves, we've been teaching absolute crap here for 40 years that we know is, is uh, not true. We want to teach something that is real. So a movement began in the, in the 70s uh, in Russia, in the Soviet, former Soviet Union, that is called the critical thinking movement, and it is spreading throughout their entire society and having huge uh, changes occur in their society as a result of this, because the teachers don't want to teach um, bogus stuff. They want to teach facts. And so they asked scientists, what is factual? So the scientists set out to find out what was factual. And one of the things they discovered was unfactual was the history that had been propagated on or uh, promulgated on all of us by the churches as the, quote, storehouse of knowledge through the, quote, dark ages. And none of that really existed. And it was created of whole cloth in the 1500s, which means that the Shroud of Turin can't be dated back to a supposed year two, uh, year zero kind of a, uh, an event or year 33, because there was never a year 33 where there was a Christ figure, and et cetera. It was all created in the Middle Ages. So everybody who thought that the Shroud of Turin was a Middle-aged hoax is 100% correct. But that needn't even invalidate its use as a burial shroud for the person that was presumed to be Christ because that person was in the the Middle Ages. Everybody who's ever made a movie about the gladiators in those funny little skirts uh, needs to rethink that and put them in the medieval garb because Rome was actually created in the 1400s. The whole myth that the Catholic Church had of being held captive by the French for the couple of centuries in Avignon is just that, a myth. The Catholic Church established itself in Rome after Rome created itself in the 1400s. The Pompeii, Pompeii was destroyed in an eruption in the 1600s, in the, excuse me, in the 16th century, 1500s. And we know that because the implements that are uncovered there are medieval in origin, and that there was only one eruption in Vesuvius that could have covered Pompeii, and it occurred in that year. And if we look at the Bible itself as a referential book, if the material in the Bible was accurate, then it must be accurate and uh, divine inspiration or whatever aside. And so if we find that the Bible describes the birth of its main uh, character here, the Christ figure, is occurring uh, at a time when we get a supernova that creates a particular kind of a star effect that lasts this long and then follows 33 years later by a, um, a solar eclipse that lasts for three and a half hours, covering the whole planet for three and a half hours, then we can say to ourselves, aha, if we can run our software against all of the star charts and everything and plot and find this particular occurrence 33 years apart, we'll know exactly when this thing occurred. And, well, hey, that the lunar eclipse occurred in 1078. Okay. We actually have, oh, we did have somebody uh, calling in to ask a question, but they have stopped calling. Um, following up on this, is there, uh, has this guy written any books? Is there something that we can uh, get our you hands can- on to read? Anatoly Fomenko is a a corresponding, and that term means something in Russia, a corresponding member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He's produced seven volumes, four of which have been translated into English. They're called History, Colon, Fact, or Science. 
uh, also called crony one through chronologies one through seven. Now, Anatoly's work from 1973 through into volume four is all about the deconstruction and why we know it to, to be true that history is false. Now, it is true that Anatoly attempts in volume six and seven along with his team. It's not just him. I mean, we're talking a team that is several hundred individuals approaching okay. this one interdisciplinary, not only astronomers, but also people that are document analysts like myself, and I can speak to that. But, um, but anyway, he tries to recreate history, and he's got a Russian bias that he can't shed, and so that creeps in. And also some of his other stuff is um, uh, uh, suspect in terms of some of the conclusions that he's drawing as to what actually occurred. But I'm convinced that he's accurate that what didn't happen uh, he's 100% on the deconstruction, and we're all grasping now because so much has been uh, hidden from us that his attempt at reconstructing history is going to be as good as anybody else's until we all get into it and really start burrowing around to find out what's going on. But I now think that the uh, catacombs in the Vatican do not contain several thousand-year-old records because the Vatican was uh, basically established in the 1400s. They may contain a lot of stuff that's hauled in from here, there, and elsewhere. But, uh, for instance, um, the documents that they have, that they've examined, uh, pretty much the, the Anatoly and his group, pretty much conclusively show that the uh, what was known as the pious forgeries movement extended multiple levels. So, there was this guy who was reputed to have written in Latin and be a uh, Roman uh, chronicler uh, at the time, uh, more or less a couple hundred years after Christ lived, theoretically in the uh, year zero realm. And this guy, this guy was a known pious forger. In other words, he theoretically in the year 100 and something, he wrote a bunch of uh, stuff to validate his faith that Christ existed and so on. And then he tried to create these things for history. But what's really interesting was the guy himself was a fiction created in the 1400s. And that's when they manufactured the uh, stages of the cross. There was never a Council of Nicaea. None of that occurred. Constantinople, the, uh, all of that business was uh, were taken from Middle Ages and pushed back. The um, The level of the fraud is staggering. But if we look at the analysis of it, basically it means that Catholicism and Christianity predates uh, Islam by no more than 200 years, and that Judaism predates Christianity by probably less than 167 years. And its calendar of being 5,000 years is also uh, completely spurious. Anatoly's work involves things like um, uh, the whole team involves things like uh, astronomical alignments. They're specifically wow. ma- mentioned in documents that prove that these documents could not have been referencing the time they claim to because there was never an astronomical alignment of that time there. And we know that this is the case now because we have software, but the guys who made the forgeries could not have known the level of our science now. And this goes to back to a thing that we saw in 1997, along with the sun disease, there was this beginning thread that we eventually named the death of religions without knowing how it could occur. But there is something in this Anatoly work that is so, uh, or this critical thinking movement that is so hugely um, uh, resonant or mind-grabbing that it makes me think right now that the seeds are already out there. I know they're out there in Russia, and he's got all seven volumes in Russian out there. And now that they're in English and selling off of Amazon as fast as they can print them, things are going to change. Uh, you, you're going to have a lot of people reappraising their relationship with the organizations that have been selling all these religious myths. Now, it doesn't mean that the theology is in a way uh, bogus or spurious, but the details that they use to sell the, the theology and the control that they have over you as a result of being the person selling it, that's going to seriously shift. So what we're, we're going back to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, that it's not the religion itself, it's the organization behind it, like basically like the banks. It, Correct. It's basically like the derivative market where you're not investing in the company anymore, you're investing in... An abstraction upon an abstraction upon a guess. Yeah, that's. Um, and how so, do we reconcile something like the, um, like in uh, ancient Egypt with the Exodus? How do how do we reconcile <laughs> the, the dates with 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 that? Well, are, are those dates wrong too? I mean, how that's do we... correct. That's correct. The the uh, Israelis never the the Jewish population never worked on the 
the Egyptian pyramids. They were never slaves to the Egyptians. Much of the, that level of the Egyptian history can be recreated. There are some anomalies about Egyptian history that are rather striking. For one thing, virtually all the hieroglyphs were uh, able to be translated from Napoleonic time onward. Uh, so linguistically, we know that something occurred. And if you actually go back there, you find that Napoleon's group discovered that the hieroglyphs are not ancient Egyptian. They're, in fact, a pictorial representation, an ideograph of what was known as Coptic, the spoken language of the of the people who lived in Egypt prior to being taken over by the Islamics, yeah. and the, and the sub, supplementation of that by Arabic. And so, of course, these people, once they realized that, they went and learned Coptic, and then they could go read the hieroglyphs just as though they were reading, uh, you know, your daily newspaper. And yet it had theoretically um, uh, not been able to be uh, determined by anybody for thousands of years, yet everybody who lived in the country spoke the language and could have easily read the hieroglyphs to anybody who wanted to ask him about them. So much of that is just entirely bogus. Plus, I have personal knowledge from a friend of mine who has been, who has allowed an extraordinary visit, and he climbed on top of the pyramid, the Great Pyramid in Giza. Yeah. And it's something they don't let you do, right? And right. His, re his report of having been there is that the sea creature's uh, that we all know about on the pyramid are in fact embedded in the stone. And so Anatoly Fomenko's group, it wasn't Anatoly, and he actually fought the idea for some time, I'm told, uh, came up with this idea that the whole idea that the pyramids were made out of cement is true. The one missing key factor in that theory is the lime kilns. In order to have that much cement, uh, that's, the pyramids are massive. Any way you look at, look at it, if they were chiseled out of stone, the stone had to come from somewhere, and yet we find no quarries anywhere where that amount of stone could come from. Plus, if it was actually made out of chunks of stone that these poor Jewish guys under whips had to haul up a ramp, that ramp would still be in existence because it would have more mass in it than that pyramid and would have had, had a more mass in it than some countries. So uh, where would they have put it afterwards? So there was no ramp found on any of these pyramids, so the construction method could not have been as described uh, in any judeo Christian uh, a work at all. And now we discover that the key missing ingredient to the cement issue is the lime kilns. And there is a history of major lime kiln operations that extend from what we think of as Western Mongolia in a giant arc terminating in Egypt. And they now that we have the history getting closer, and we think of things a little bit differently, we know that these lime kilns were in existence at the same time that the pyramids were created. Holy we also, crap. exactly, and also in in chap in book one, we discover that all the cathedrals are not as has been described to us in, in Europe, and that when they go and they do mortar dating tests on them, they can show the results to support the suppositions that are coming out that everybody had by basis of document study. And let me let me say the, the about the document study. You're going to get a lot of people that say, oh, you can't study documents and you can't tell when something was written just by the words that were used. And I dispute that. There, and, and in fact, there's a whole um, uh, a study uh, uh, about such kind of document analysis that says precisely that. The language employed describes the person employing that language as much as the subject. And so when we get to things like Ptolemy, the great astronomer who wrote this uh, supposedly uh, monumental uh, seminal astronomy work way back in 137 AD, mm -hmm. and he's and he is writing with language that is typical of 14th century uh, florific Italian. Uh, then you know it was written in the 14th century in Italy, not in uh, Egypt in the 137 AD. And when he start, and it, that is true with his great work. I've never read it. I've often read about it. But when I read in the um, volume three of the uh, history uh, series here uh, about the Ptolemy being a fake, I went and read the Almagest, and I'm here to tell you that was written in the 14th century in in Italy because the language, even though it was in it in Latin, is has the same flourish, and everything speaks to Italian. Um, uh, publication for a nobleman, which would not be the case if it had been written in the supposed 137 A.D. Yeah, and I think anybody in the audience that doesn't grasp that, go and look at the early documents of our own country and think about how we speak now and look at those, and you can tell basically what era those are written in because it's, uh, it's English, but it's 
the words are different, the flourishes are different, and the adjectives and verbs and everything are different, right? Correct. Plus, in this case, we have a document that was written in Latin, and everybody who translates into Latin from their own native language imposes a certain um, constraint on those uh, translations. So the person who wrote the Almagest was not a native Latin uh, thinker or writer and and spoke natively Italian because it shows clearly in which words they chose the conjugations, the declinations, and how they chose to use the imperative. Wow. That's, um... And that's one of thousands and thousands of cited cases. Anatoly's group did something remarkable. Holy They're part crap. of... This is just... This is just... Yeah, I never but, expected this conversation to go in this direction. I'm just, um, my mind is reeling at this point, Cliff. It's good. Same here. And I've been reading this stuff for weeks. And it's going to take me months to integrate it and decide how to react to the world with this new knowledge. But the thing that Anatoly did uh, that was really smart on, on his part, that I know that it was personal, his personal decision, was that he decided way back when that they would put in every single data item they found into these books such that when you came to discuss it as a reader of their book with someone else, you would have all of the facts at your disposal to to get the point across because it is such mind-warping, point-of-view-shattering information. Wow. I've had uh, two people in the chat so far that this is say that this is the most interesting interview you've ever given. <laughs> well, hey, wait wait until I get into books five and six. <laughs> All right, let, let's uh, let's switch gears here for a little while for the rest of the show because I'm not sure if I could take much more of this. Yeah, I will. Okay, that, that's good. But let me also point out that we don't have books five and six uh, in English yet, so I'm forced okay. to read them in Russian, so it'll be slow going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just uh, t take your time and uh, and uh, stop hurting our brains, please. Oh, my okay. God. I've got a... I've got to look. I've got to look at some more of this stuff because this is just uh, stunning. It, it is truly staggering. It, it, it is. It's it's, it's staggering beyond too. the point of of belief. You you hear it and you say, "There's Cliff must be on uh, some kind of what kind of what the hell kind of drugs do you got in your pie out there?" Well, it wouldn't make any difference. There's no drug that would come to this level of uh, shattering of your brain. I mean, I've done acid, and it won't have as permanent an effect on me as reading these books. This is staggering. These people, the critical thinking movement is what I, I started getting hints of this years ago because I have a, a, a history of having been in Europe and been into Russia and speak Russian and, uh, you know, a neo Chinhata show, but, but I still speak and understand the stuff. Um, I have contacts in Russia and so on, and there were hints of this coming out, but they are keeping this rather in, tightly controlled at the government level. They're not suppressing it, but they're not advertising that this critical thinking movement is sweeping through their entire social structure, obviously because a lot of people still are defending the old paradigm, and they don't want to upset the apple cart. They want it to emerge naturally. And when you get into the critical thinking stuff, it, it really is staggering. For instance, some of the stuff coming out in it suggests that people like Isaac Newton went through ages of work to accommodate um, a lunar structure, what's known as the libration mm -hmm. of the moon, uh, based on a historical stuff, and he was matching it against bogus history, so no wonder none of his math worked about the moon. And if he only knew the history was bogus, he would have just saved himself 28 years. That's just crazy talk. That's insane. But I don't want anybody to believe me. I want them to go on out and find these books and read them. They, they are online in Russian. Uh, so you can get at a lot of the material if you want to go and try and do the translations, but the auto-translations are not really that good. 